thank you very much for the introduction. Well, dear colleagues, dear students from abroad and here from Lubecke, a very warm welcome to Lubecke and Wittekind. So, as was said, my name is Eva Tagemeyer and I'm head of Wittekind Gymnasium. And let me welcome you on behalf of all the staff and all the students of our school. I hope you had a pleasant journey and arrived safe and sound here in Lübecke and in your host families. Well, as you can imagine, so while preparing the meeting here at Wittekind Gymnasium, the conversations and worries in the organizing committee almost daily circled around the questions of the corona pandemic, its constant twists and turns, and ever-changing regulations. It is definitely not the best time for traveling and meetings. But there was hope. Vaccination campaigns, the less severe Omicron variant, Preventive measures, which have become a daily routine, made us confident that an event like this is manageable. And so we face the challenge, and now you are really here. That's great. Dear delegates, dear teachers from Belgium, Luxembourg, Poland, Slovakia, and Spain, Thank you so much for making this come true today. And I also express my sincere thanks to the organizing committee, to Petra, Jessica, Silke, Maren, and Alexandra. Recording in progress. You are exceptionally committed teachers, I must say, who do not only invest a lot of personal energy and passion in the Erasmus Plus projects. You also show courage and fearfulness to come and travel under those circumstances. Well, dear students, so with this in mind, and all the obstacles you and we had to face. So this deserves a round of applause for all the organizing team and your teachers who have made this possible today. So give them a round of applause. Well, we are not here to talk about Corona, we are here to deal with a much more serious threat. The threat to our environment, the threat to mankind, the threat to our blue planet. Only yesterday did the World Wildlife Fund say that plastic has infiltrated all parts of the ocean, calling for urgent efforts to create an international treaty on plastics. According to a report published by World Wildlife Fund, 88% of marine species are affected by severe contamination of plastic in the ocean. 88%. Well, mega, our conference motto. Making our environment great again is the motto of your conference here in Lubeck. And the question must also be, what can every one of us do to save our environment? And I am sure there is enough we can do. And plastic pollution is just one threat. This morning, we are going to focus on climate change. And I am glad to announce that we could win three experts in this field. So I welcome online 
uh, Professor Dr. Peter Lemke from renowned Alfred Wegener Institute, Bremerhaven, and climate psychologist Professor Gerhard Rese from University Koblenz Landau, who are joining us online via Zoom. And I warmly welcome Mr. Tankoff and Ms. Wilhelm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Organize the first part of the program today. And Mr. Tenkov is an expert in climate change as well, and he has organized numerous events and conferences here in our region, and not only here in our region, but I suppose in Germany. And so he's really motivated to make you feel sensitive for the problems of our environment. So, Professor Lenke, Professor Wiese, Mr. Tankov and Mrs. Ms. William, thank you for being with us today. Now we are looking forward to the mega program and I pass the floor on. I wish you a mind, mind expanding experience and conference here in Lübeck and our guests a pleasant stay in our town. Thank you very much. We didn't know whether we could meet here or not, but luckily that's the case. This mega conference can be possible if not due to the efforts of our teachers and students, for which I want to thank them a lot. We, the Witzke Gymnasium of Lübecke, greet our guests from all the foreign countries, teachers and students likewise. Cześć, Viktor Lidia Nezelika from Poland. Ahoy, 
Alexandra Via and Victoria from Slovenia. Salut, bonsoir, Diego Manoubi from Belgium. Um, bonjour, Tom Manoubi from Luxembourg. And voila, Amanda, Dara, and Martin from Spain. Um, it's great to see you here. I recognize some old faces, but lots of new ones. And I'm looking forward to work alongside you for the following day. Let me promise you, we of the German Mega Club have prepared an interesting program for you. In three days from now, we're going to go on many excursions, as for example, the one to the local swamp, as well as to the neighboring town of Minden. We will learn about being more sustainable and how we can help this beautiful earth. When I was in Poland a few weeks ago, with two more students due to a mega meeting in Peru, we had lots of fun and of another group of students, which is our daughter last year, too, they told us how much they enjoyed their visit in Spain. We will try our best that you too can return to your country and tell your parents and friends how much you liked being our guests. Let's hope we get to know each other better during your stay here. Let's get valuable memories and maybe even make some new friends. We, the visiting the Garden of Lumpur, know that young people need young people in real life and not just online. We know that we are the power we need to face and tackle climate change, even if it's step by step by step. But the first step must be, can only be, and should be done by education. That's why we wish this meeting of ours best of luck as we overcome this horrendous pandemic plaguing us for nearly two years. I'm sure it's in our power to do so. But for now, welcome to Lutka and thank you for coming, dear friends from all over Europe. We appreciate your coming and feel very honored that you, right now, sit before us. Thank you. Okay, this fulfills the speeches and now I would like to um, yield the floor to our next presentation. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, it's an honor for me that I can be here and tell you something about climate change and some solutions. But uh, first of all, I need to stress I'm not an expert in climate change and climate research, but we have one of the most famous uh, climate researchers of Germany in our conference, Professor Peter Lemke. And uh, you realize this in this moment, I'm also not an expert in English. I had, when I was in school, a five minus, a five minus, almost a six. So insufficient. And uh, only the reason that I created an event, a garden party for my English teacher, is a reason that I didn't get a six. So sometimes I feel kind of alone. Now, like the Earth in this picture, one of the most famous classical picture or photograph ever taken. It was taken by the astronaut Anders Apollo 8 in the year 1968 by chance. And um, you see the blue marble from the moon and realize we are still alone. Even if researchers think that there is life somewhere else in the universe, we are still alone. And I feel a little alone when I got the email from Mrs. Miller, from the teacher, uh, before Christmas. By the way, the picture was taken at Christmas, 24th of December, 1968. I got the email and she asked me if I would do the job because uh, she thinks that I'm the right one to explain you something, uh, tell you something about climate change and solutions. And uh, she told me that you are coming from uh, different nations, from Belgium, Slovakia, Poland, Luxembourg, and Spain. And uh, I said, yes, I do it. But I realized yesterday evening <laughs> by doing the last step before this um, speech here. Oh my goodness, my English. So, 
don't um, uh, do me the favor if I'm looking for some words which are missing, that give me a chance and uh, help me during the speech. Because sometimes we feel alone. We feel alone in the universe. We have just this one planet and I know someone else who also was alone when she started the biggest campaign ever seen in this regard, Rita Thunberg. What I'm doing, your director told us already, we are doing student climate summits in great cinemas, the first one in Bremen. We also did it on the island Sylt in the northern part of Germany and uh, also in the sea, um, uh, in a big sea, in a big lake, close constant, the lake close, uh, constant in the southern part of Germany with 1,400 students. And our concept is that you do the whole moderation. That's our concept. So we have speakers like Professor Lemke, but you are the moderator of this science show in movie theaters, theaters or digital during Corona. Here you see, for instance, the special clothes they wear when they are in the eyes of the climate researchers. Um, and here also student speakers who are doing the job of Professor Lemke. And that is our system. And um, I realized also during Corona that people like Elisa, your English is great by the way, and yours also, so, my goodness, when I look back to my uh, school time, my favorite subject was chemistry. English wasn't, and um, now I have to do my homework, being a little bit older. So you see here our video conference systems, and the student moderators are doing the moderation and talk to the scientists and to other students which we take by video conferences from Shanghai, Africa, or even from Sydney and New Zealand. Um, now in this moment, um, I'm very glad to introduce to you Professor Peter Lemke, who is the researcher in the field of climate change. And before he starts his um, presentation, I thought, as you know, I think, I assume that you know everything about climate change and you know the impact, but I realized during our conferences since 2012 that there are a lot of people out there, in your age and younger, they don't have the knowledge about climate change. And let me show you the problem. You know the problem, but when I go to a school with students which are longer, I always take a glass with mineral water and say, students, what is our problem? And I say, it's the gas. And what's the problem with the gas? Yes, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can drink mineral water, so it, it tastes very well, and that is our problem. And Professor Lemke will tell us that we have just 450 parts per 1 million parts air, and that is the reason that our, that our Earth, which I've uh, shown you the, uh, the Earth rise, that's the reason that we exist, and that our planet is blue, and not a white snowball. So, Professor Lemke, I'm very, very glad that you are in the conference and help me because your English is much better, but not only your English. You are one of the most famous researchers in this field and you helped us during our student uh, climate summits since 2012, every year, in almost every conference. 
you are one of the leading researchers and you got um, with the Al Gore also and the IPCC the Nobel Peace Prize in the year 2007. Professor Lempke, can you see us by the way? Well, I see the audience oh, okay. and I did. So, uh, we need to change the picture. That is now the problem. Let me see. Let me see. I, but I can, I can hear you, but I know your face, of course. <laughs> it's, it's my mistake. But Emily is beside me, and now we can see you, Professor Lemke. I'm very sorry if the technique and the great that you know what to do and that you help me. Uh, Professor Lemke, welcome you uh, to this student conference. It's our first international one here with students from different countries in Europe. Um, before we start, we should start the video. And I switched the, I switched the um, computer for this presentation. Let me see if I can do it. This was a small clip from the Alfred Wegener Institute, which showed you the area where Professor Lemke did the research. How often, Professor Lemke, have you been in the Antarctic? Or Arctic? I always mix it up. <laughs> Sorry. Well, they, they, they are different. They're quite different, of course. Uh, and in the Arctic, you have the polar bears, and the uh, Antarctic, you have. Penguins. I've been uh, four times in winter time in the Antarctic, and uh, one time in the summer in the Antarctic, and I think four times in the Arctic. Uh, Professor Lemke, um, by the way, uh, we have students here. Um, what was the reason that you decided to become a climate scientist or researcher? Oh, good question. Yeah, I was. Uh, I studied uh, theoretical physics uh, at the university, and after my diploma, I thought, well, what shall I do? Um, and uh, since I was one of the 68th generation, I wanted to do something for 
mankind. And uh, since I decided not to become a physician, I became a physicist working in climate research. Uh, Professor Menke, I mentioned already that you did uh, quite often uh, some uh, work as, uh, in, the part, in several parts of the World Climate Report, the IPCC. Um, when you compare the results of the last World Climate Report um, last year, with the results uh, of your research. Um, can you say something to that? Where are the differences? And what are the major results um, uh, of the last one? Well, the uh, results of the latest reports, they are just continuing the things that we have seen since 1990. So the basic message is the same. We are Knowing the climate through CO2 emissions, and uh, if we just continue this, this will be a disaster for mankind. And uh, uh, my research, at least, at least part of it, was actually implemented also in the report, so written as a text. And I've worked uh, on the text since uh, on all five uh, pre uh, previous reports since 1990 up to 2013, and the last report I was just a, a reviewer and I looked whether they did things all right or not. Last question uh, before you start the presentation, Professor Lenke, how does it feel when you are in the Antarctic doing research for yeah, several months? How long uh, is the period when you are in the Arctic, for instance? Or you have been in the Arctic? Uh, something between two and three months, and uh, the feeling, well, I mean, what you see, especially in the Antarctic, is the beauty of water, because water is a very special substance, and on our planet, uh, it uh, occurs in all three phases, as a gas, as a liquid, as a solid, in the same place, so if you just uh, 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 near an iceberg in Antarctica, for instance, with a boat, so you are on the water, you have ice in front of you, and in the air you have water vapor. And the beauty of uh, ice crystals, uh, I mean, everybody knows, and the beauty of icebergs, especially the old ones, who are decaying, is just incredible. It's like with old people, they get, uh, uh, the, the beauty gets uh, greater than uh, with this age. <laughs> on, the, on the one hand, you say that uh, you tell us something about the beauty. On the other hand, you know that uh, astronauts train in the Arctic for their um, Mars missions. So it's uh, also kind of dangerous in this area. You mentioned that um, several times in the conferences. And um, the question, uh, dear students and teachers uh, from different countries, in Europe, the questions why the climate researchers go in this dangerous and also beautiful area with eyes. The solution and the result of this question, Professor Peter Lemke will tell us now in his presentation. I hope you can see the presentation now. Can you see the yes. presentation? Yes, well, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't realize that's the problem. No, we see it very good. It's fine. I think of. Yes. Can you see the presentation? Yes, it works. Can you understand? It works, it's fine. Can you use the chat and say it's okay? I do it in another way. It's fine, Professor Nemke. Yeah, I just wanted to see. I asked you, obviously, I, the connection is, is bad. Well, 
solar energy and the ongoing uh, infrared radiation in the face can estimate uh, from the physical law that the temperature at the outer uh, uh, ranges of the atmosphere is minus 18 degrees. And we know this uh, quite well. Uh, this can be measured. This is a global measure. Uh, this can be measured from the space station, or has been measured from the space station, for instance. And the minus 18, you can understand also, because if you fly uh, to other continents and, and the screen on the computer in the uh, airplane shows you temperature, the temperature above the clouds is minus 50. So half a planet is cloudy, uh, it radiates with minus 50 out into space, and the other half, uh, there is the surface uh, radiating out into the surfaces plus 40 in the Sahara at uh, uh, lunchtime and uh, minus 70 or 80 in Antarctica. Uh, and this mixture is minus 18. This temperature would also uh, uh, occur at the Earth's surface if we would not have natural greenhouse effect. And this natural greenhouse effect is very important and it's very important that we don't, don't disturb it, as I will show later. So the natural greenhouse effect works like this. The solar radiation gets into uh, the atmosphere, reaches the surface of the Earth, warms the Earth's surface, and the Earth's surface gets rid of this uh, heat by uh, sending thermal radiation out, in, uh, out upwards, out into the atmosphere, out into space. And the thermal radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere, and only part is uh, getting out into the into space. And so the absorption in the atmosphere, the atmosphere warms up and sends that heat also partly upward and partly downward. And this part that uh, gets uh, to the Earth's surface, that's called the terrestrial greenhouse, the Earth's greenhouse effect, the natural greenhouse effect. And this natural greenhouse effect increases the surface temperature by 33 degrees which is important because under minus 18, life would not be possible. And uh, this, with plus 15 on average, uh, global average, we have life as we know it. And this, uh, uh, of course, raises the question directly, the greenhouse gases, have they changed? And if they change, the greenhouse effect would change, and the temperature at the surface would change. For the question which is which is the most important greenhouse gas, it's water vapor. Sixty percent of the greenhouse effect is produced by water vapor, but water vapor cannot increase indefinitely. So when the saturation pressure is reached, water vapor condenses and then it drains. So water vapor actually condenses and rains down to the earth's surface again. So there's an upper limit for the water vapor. There is no upper limit for carbon, carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas uh, for climate change. And uh, we know the absorption properties in the atmosphere very well. So this process is very well understood. And the question is, did the greenhouse gases change with time? And we know this. Um, the ice cores in an ice sheet. So this is the, the right side here, the place of Arctic ground, the left side, uh, the Arctic, Greenland ice sheet. Uh, but in most cases, these ice sheets are actually fused by snow. So snow is falling and it's accumulating over the years, or over many, many, many thousands of years. And the upper snow layers are actually compressing the lower snow layers uh, to ice. And uh, the ice, actually, since snow is very fluffy and has a lot of air in it, uh, the ice also conserves the air bubbles here. This is ice of, uh, say, this height, maybe 100 meters below the surface, where you see the air bubbles in the ice. And chemists can actually analyze the composition of the air uh, in the ice. And since we know that the oldest ice is at the bottom and the youngest ice is at the top, we can actually measure the scale 
uh, and the term then would be the time, which is here the x-axis, the time and the con uh, concentration of the CO2 content. So this is the blue curve here, shows the CO2 content in the ice bubbles from the top, which you see on the right, to the bottom, which you see on the left. 800,000 years of record. And it shows that in the ice ages, so the glacier times, the CO2 content was always, almost always 180 ppm parts per million per volume. And during the warm ages, it was uh, 480. So the uh, amplitude between ice age and warm age, and the ice age and the warm age, is about 100 parts per million. And this is important. This is the range uh, of uh, the Earth's system. And it tells us that uh, the transition from the Ice Age to the Warm Age takes about 20,000 years. So it takes 20,000 years to adjust to a, a CO2 change of uh, uh, 100 years. So this red curve are the current observation. It tells us that uh, by the last, at the end of the last year, we have 416 parts per million now in the atmosphere as an atmospheric concentration. And this is our problem. And uh, there are two graphs in my talk that we should take back home. And you should always be able to explain it. So this is the old record of the CO2, and this is the new measurement. And we see that we have put more CO2 into the atmosphere and going to the transition of the ice age to the warm age. And we have done this in 50 or 60 years instead of 20,000. And this is a problem. The rate of CO2 emissions cannot be digested by the Earth system. So it remains in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. And uh, it just shows that the human activities have strongly increased the greenhouse effect. And this is actually the largest uh, fraction, uh, the largest concentration since 30 million years. And this is something that we are actually doing. So this is our experiment with the Earth. And this is dangerous, as I would call it. Oh. The consequence is that the temperature is rising. And this was the temperature range here, uh, the anomalies since 1880 to 2021, the last bar. And we actually see that there is an increase over the last uh, 60 years or so by one degree. And the total uh, and, uh, since 142 years is 1.1 degrees. So most of the trend is occurring in the last 60 years. And this is a uh, graph from the last IPCC report. It shows the uh, uh, solid line here is the same as on the left side. And the uh, brown line here and the green line here with the error bars are two sets of uh, uh, climate simulation. One with only the natural forcing for solar and volcanic, and one is with the greenhouse gases that we have increased. And you can see this, uh, the observed warming in the past uh, 60 years or so is extremely unlike the natural variability alone. And uh, the greenhouse gases very likely caused the observed warming since uh, uh, 79. So this is very clear that uh, the CO2 causes the warming. And since we are increasing the CO2, we are counting the warming. So the global warming is our doing. There's no question about this. And the consequence is that the ice is melting everywhere. In the mountains, uh, in the Arctic and Antarctic. And this uh, shows the ice mass change in uh, the Antarctic, which is a red, and the Antarctic, which is blue, uh, uh, the green and this blue, this is the Antarctic red, and the green and this blue. And you see that there's a stronger loss in Greenland and uh, uh, not quite a strong loss in Antarctica, but they are both uh, producing meltwater, and this meltwater increases the sea level. Greenland is uh, uh, raising the sea level this year by 0.9 millimeter, Antarctica 0.5, and all the mountain glaciers are 0.6. And this is uh, what we see in the 
and then uh, currency that arises 3.7 millimeter a year as I will show on the next next graph. So the sea level is rising everywhere. Also because it's not just the meltwater, but it's uh, the uh, heat. The heat uh, is expanding uh, the volume of the ocean, and therefore the ocean surface is rising just because of the warming. So what else? So the global warming is also increasing the chance of uh, extreme weather. So this shows the heat waves, and you see a simple uh, graphic of North America here, North America, Eurasia, Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, and Pacific Islands. And all the other uh, red brownish uh, areas here show that there's an increase in hot extremes. And uh, especially where you see the sea bottom. And this is uh, very clear for Eurasia, here also for parts of Africa, uh, for, for North America and for South America and for Africa and Australia. It's very clear that the hot extremes are increasing. And how about rain? Well, this is the increase in heavy rainfall for the green areas here. And you see very clear in Northern Europe, the heavy precipitation is uh, very significant. But there are other areas where the heavy precipitation is increasing. And uh, the out, so no rainfall at all, you see that there are parts of the world where the drought is increasing too, especially here. And this is, of course, what the, uh, uh, our friends in Spain no notice is that there is a Mediterranean area. Uh, out uh, occurring uh, quite frequently now. The question is how does this, uh, so this was the present uh, situation, so the question is how does this uh, actually go on in the future? And uh, as I showed you, we know the climate system quite well. Uh, we know the force of the sun, we can measure how much energy, energy uh, get we, uh, we get from the sun uh, through satellites. And uh, we know the interactions between the different systems, all the red arrows here in this case. And we know the basic parts of physics, which are conservation laws, conservation of heat, momentum, and matter. And the only thing that, that we don't know is uh, how much does the human impact change in the future. So we know how, how much it did in the past, but we don't know how much is uh, changing in the future. And we cannot predict it. And therefore, we have to make scenarios because we cannot predict the economic uh, development. There are no rules about this. And uh, we cannot really foresee the technological development. And uh, um, so this is why we make scenarios. And the scenarios just say, well, let's assume maybe we just go on as, we, uh, uh, as uh, now business as usual, or we stop emitting. These print scenarios are the, re the response of climate models to these different scenarios are shown here. So this is the temperature scale, change in temperature from, uh, so this is the past, so from uh, 2015 or so into the future, until the end of the century. And these are the various scenarios, which mean we are saving a lot, very, very fast, and so we can stay uh, near. Uh, 1.5 degrees, or we don't do. There are only two scenarios to do this, and all the other scenarios are giving us hot environments by the end of the century. So this is uh, 4 to 5 degrees. And the question is we have to avoid this because even now uh, we have heat waves and we have uh, floods which we suffer from. And so we have to avoid this question how. Which I, will, which I will discuss at the end of our talk. So now this is the future of a 1.5 degree world up by 4 degree world. And you see that in all cases of this simulation, we have the lowest warming, the strongest warming in high latitudes. And uh, therefore the effects of course, the ice sheets and the mountain glaciers and 
sea that's in the uh, Arctic. And this is how it would look like for the expectation for a 1.5 degree world on the left and a world on the right. And you can see that the high regions that we have here, also in the Mediterranean, they will increase. And at the wet regions of the north, they will get wetter. So there will be more rain in the northern regions, there will be more rain in the monsoon areas, and uh, uh, also in the Sahel there will be more rain, but uh, this is a bit unfortunate this graph because this is just a percentage thing. Since it doesn't rain in the Sahara very much, the 40% change doesn't give very much rain either. So uh, it just shows the percentage change in the rainfall. And, uh, and uh, across in Europe, it's basically a high zone in the Mediterranean, which will in summertime expand even to the summer. And we noticed that a few years ago when we had very dry summers. This is the sea level. The rising sea level will be uh, a meter if we are not careful, and uh, at least half a meter, definitely half a meter more. And uh, that is for sure, so we have to raise the light. And what can we do about this? So this is the other graph that you should take at home. This shows, very important graph, this shows the warming as a function of the total CO2 that we have emitted into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, about 1850. So this is the past, the past temperature and the past emission of uh, CO2. So this is today. But if we want to know how much we can actually emit until we hit the 1.5 degrees, we just have to look at the scale here. So this is today, or 2020, and this is what we have left until we hit 1.5 degrees. And this is the number. For the remaining budget since the January of 2020 is 500 gigatons we do for 1.5 degrees. For 2 degrees, we can do the same experiment here. It would be 1,750. So but these numbers then don't tell us much, except if we know how much we need currently emit. And we currently emit 37 gigatons per year. Humans are emitting 37 gigatons per year. So this would give us 14 years until we hit the 1.5 degree mark, and 36 until we hit and then we have to stop the two emissions or the use of fossil fuels totally. So gas, oil and coal totally, which is impossible to stop immediately. So we stop uh, to increase to decrease the CO2 uh, emissions to increase increase the uh, alternative energy form immediately so that we can actually uh, uh, the constraint of 14 years, so we can actually uh, stop at, uh, say, uh, 200, uh, 2050 if we start immediately with uh, the, uh, the, the uh, stopping the emissions. And how can we do this? So the left graph here shows the uh, greenhouse gas emissions per person uh, and per sector in Germany. And this is uh, Canada, and I think in the other European countries, except that uh, in some countries the amount is a bit smaller. Uh, <coughs> so this uh, shows that most of our CO2 footprint, that's what it is, most of our CO2 footprint is uh, our consumption. So everything that we buy from t shirts to computers to, to bicycles and cars, so everything has to be produced. And that requires energy, and this energy comes from fossil fuels in most cases. So the next is mobility. We are driving cars which we could not buy from oxygen, and we could not use the fossil fuel for this. Eating, of course, then food, we are still uh, putting too much food into the waste in, and, uh, and then public emissions here and the electricity. And so we know, of course, what to do. So the first thing to do is to mitigate, to reduce our equipment would be to uh, have less, assumption, less consumption. 
And this just means the U.S. always should pay, which is now, was 19, was 29th of July, worldwide. For Germany, it was the uh, 1st of May, roughly. And this just means that mankind uses two planets, the resources of two planets. When I started at the university in 1970, uh, the uh, first pay was the end of the year. So then we have used all the resources from the Earth, which uh, the Earth replenishes in the same year. But now we are actually overdoing this, and the Earth is not replenishing our resources, so we are just uh, uh, going into, into a bad, pretty bad situation. What, what, what shall we do except uh, uh, less consumption? It's uh, increasing energy efficiency. So saving energy is a bit, uh, the sim simplest and the, the cheapest uh, way actually to do this. We have to do, of course, for, uh, use alternative energy and heating technologies, uh, transfer system, and assigning for single burning materials. So we have to get away from concrete. So these last three points, that's where the governments, the local government, but also the federal government, have to do something about uh, supporting this also so that people can actually use it. But we have to adapt because the uh, locomotive of uh, climate change is running and the uh, uh, distance until it can stop is long. The sea level will rise. In any case, it, it, it doesn't matter what we do. So it will rise uh, until uh, at least uh, 300 or 500 years or even longer. So we have to protect against flooding. And the flooding at the coast, but also the flooding inland through heavy precipitation, extreme weather, and actually heat waves. So this is what we have to do. So we know what we have to do. And uh, we know, this is my last slide. We know that uh, China, climate change is real, that we are causing it, climate change is dangerous, and the experts agree, and we can still do something, but we have to act immediately. Thank you.
And when you start to calculate how many gigatons we have and how long we can use coal and fossil energy in order to heat and to have uh, electricity, you do it in this precise way and always you say it in the same way and I'm always shocked. Yeah, Mr. Tenkov, it's pretty simple. That's physics. And physics, you can believe. Physics exists, that's reality. And physics is something, when I take a pen and throw the pen in your direction, it will fall down, not only on Earth, it also will fall down on the Moon and on the Mars. Because physics works in the whole universe in the same way and climate change based on CO2, we have it also on the Biden, on the Venus, the next planet, our neighbor, you have an atmosphere with 96.5% CO2, and the temperature on the Venus is more than five, uh, 496 degrees. So, living on the Venus is not possible. And the only reason that it works on our planet is that we have a small amount of CO2 in this mineral water and this amount is so tiny that we are not a snowball in the universe. And that's the reason why we are here. Now we have to change the subject and um, we are talking about something it sounds in the very first moment a little strange. We are talking about psychology. And uh, after the email, after the email of Mrs. Miller uh, uh, at that time, when she asked me to do the presentation, I watched television. In my age, my generation looked sometimes television, even if I uh, use YouTube when I'm running every morning. And uh, one of the biggest television channels called the second German television, ZDF, there was a science program called Terra X, a very famous one. And I saw Terra X, and then I saw an interview with Professor Dr. Gerhard Reese. He is an environmental uh, psychologist. And I was amazed. And typical for me, other people are different, I wrote an email, it was two days before Christmas, I wrote an email to the professor Leser and ask him, would you do us a favor, help me with my bad, with my bad English, we need you in Lübeck, because we have here students from different countries in Europe. And professor Leser answered almost immediately, not this evening, but in the next week, and said, of course, I will do that. So I was really glad to discover this researcher in the field of psychology. And uh, now I want to introduce you, Professor Gerd Eser, and say thank you very much that you helped us here in this conference. And I would like you to ask me one question first. What did you want to be when you were a student? Professor Eser, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me and see? Yeah, it works. It's fine. Good. I do always the same thing here. <laughs> you see <that? laughs> Very good. Yeah, um, here yeah, regarding your question, uh, when I was a student at school, like a, a pupil, I wanted to become a pilot um, of airplanes. And uh, when I was studying, um, I, I can't really remember. I never wanted to be a scientist um, at the beginning, but uh, that happened eventually. And um, yeah, now things are as they are. That's good. Um, your science is environmental psychology. Would you please explain what that is? What is your job? Yeah, for, yeah environmental psychology. Um, this is the yeah, the subfield of psychology that deals with human environment interactions. We look at how we as humans act on the environment, what are the consequences of our behaviors, uh, what are the drivers of our behaviors. Um, and we also look at how the environment uh, acts on us. So what do changes in the environment, uh, how do they relate to our 
thinking, our behavior. Just for example, I uh, think most of you know that when you take a nice walk through a beautiful forest, you feel much more soothing, afterwards you feel much more relaxed, much uh, experience, much less stress. Um, when we look at what the climate crisis does, uh, there's more research showing that being confronted with the climate crisis uh, results in yeah, uh, emotional reactions such as climate anxiety or deep uh, concern about um, what's going to happen in these years. So we are at the intersection of uh, yeah, understanding our actions vis-a-vis um, -vis the environment. Uh, I found your, your biography, uh, Professor Rehbe, that you also did some research at the University of Luxembourg that explains that your English is so great, by the way. But um, looking uh, to the, your definition, um, you are the expert who can tell us, also the students, how can I change my behavior? That's for sure. So when I ask you, for instance, Changing the behavior, changing the behavior, um, my first idea is, um, for instance, don't uh, use sugar. Eating um, food without sugar, for instance, or doing some more sports to be fit. So changing the behavior is quite difficult. And you are an expert in this regard, and to tell us Oh my goodness, I see something on the screen which I didn't, shouldn't, say, uh, shouldn't see. Um, so you are an expert who can explain us the different steps in order to change the behavior. Our topic is climate change. One way to change the behavior is instead of eating meat, sometimes I eat meat, uh, eating just vegetables and so forth. Is that correct? Well, this is this is one one short puzzle piece of the answer. Yes. Um, would you do us a favor and uh, tell us in a in small sentence, in brief sentences, how can we change? Um, for instance, um, uh, the consumption that we don't buy sweets or that we do some more sports. In three four sentences, is that possible? I can try. Um, <laughs> try, please. Yeah, sure. Well, on a, on a very basic level, uh, although we are all individuals, um, we are of course, uh, yeah, we are of course a product, and uh, I don't know, uh, actors um, as a function of our society. So we cannot easily say, hey, don't eat sweets anymore, when these sweets are so uh, easily available. And this is the same with uh, other actions when it comes to eating meat versus uh, eating vegetarian. When we are in a context where eating meat is uh, the cheapest, the most abundant, the most normative, the most socially acceptable thing to do, for example, a barbecue, it is very likely that people will eat meat. So the change um, or behavior, it's not just something that has to come from inside of us. Of course, uh, there are things that will motivate us uh, intrinsically. But um, a, lot of, a lot of our behaviors are guided by what's going on around us, what's going on around us in terms of, uh, well, what do my friends do, what do my peers do, what does my community do, what do others do, what is the normative frame? So um, it is very complex, and these were seven sentences, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, yeah, I tried. Um, Professor Reza, what are the key findings of environmental psychology important for environmental well, I think there are maybe three key findings. First one, um, there are many individual factors that uh, affect our behavior, such as uh, feelings of anger or feelings of guilt can be motivating uh, our subjective norm or feeling of what is right or wrong can be motivating, or our feeling of uh, yeah, what is just or not just uh, can motivate our behavior. More importantly is, uh, for environmental protection, you know that the climate crisis and every other environmental crisis is a collective crisis, and as an individual, um, this becomes very difficult because uh, if I go to the supermarket and decide for an organic product, um, the effect is negligible. So what we need is a perspective, uh, and this is what environmental psychology has developed over the last uh, couple of years, that takes into account the collective effect. 
actions. We need collective actions. We need a lot of people that engage uh, with these behaviors. We need movements that we have, luckily, by now. We need communities that act together. Uh, so this is the part of psychology where it becomes very social, where we have to look at the social processes that guide our behavior. And the third part is, of course, the systemic part. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we are individuals, but we are not living in a vacuum. So we are very much uh, affected by what is going on around us. And there is a lot of political frames, a lot of political decisions that could be made that would make yeah, poor environmental or poor climate action much easier. So we are, yeah, we have to understand that, that we constantly interact with our surroundings. And if these surroundings change, if some policies change, this would make it easier to act. Hopefully, in the last, um, in the last area of the Corona crisis, what does the Corona crisis teach us? What lessons can be applied to the climate crisis? Well, to be honest, um, at the beginning of the Corona crisis, uh, nearly two years from now, uh, I have been quite optimistic because. Uh, that there was a lot of uh, solidarity, uh, at least uh, it, was, um, yeah, it was communicated that there would be. Uh, there was a lot of uh, findings that, uh, yeah, traveling less and uh, yeah, factories working less and so on had a positive impact, but that was very short term. Over the course of the crisis, um, I believe that there's nothing we could use as a blueprint uh, for yeah, our reactions to the climate crisis, because what happened is, from my perspective, uh, that everything related to Rona uh, was tried to be solved uh, very individually, very uh, yeah, egoistically on a national level. So there was not much cooperation between nations. There were, even within Germany, when you look at the 16 federal states, uh, completely different rules, completely different exceptions, completely different uh, ways to deal with it. And I think this is something that we should definitely not uh, use when it comes to solving the climate crisis. Of course, there must be countries or states that go ahead and do something without waiting on the others. But uh, eventually, we need a concerted action by many, many countries in the world, especially the rich ones who are responsible for the mess. Um, and this is, yeah, so, so I'm not, I have become rather pessimistic that the corona crisis is in any case, uh, yeah, um, I don't know, helpful in looking at how we can solve the climate crisis. Your area of psychology is, from, from my point of view, one of the most important parts in order to change our behavior. And here we have students from different countries, and I assume they are good students and uh, pretty intelligent. I'm pretty sure in this regard. Um, so, you are kind of ambassadors, that's the idea. And um, you've got some knowledge here in the field of physics as well as knowledge in the field of psychology. So the question to Professor Lesen to you is, what advice do you give to students who want to make a change when they are at the beginning of their own initiative? Greta Thunberg started with a poster, and she was absolutely alone at the beginning. And it's very hard to be alone and to do something and the whole society and a lot of uh, politicians against um, uh, uh, myself. Um, in this regard, do you have some, some tips, some advices? Well, I think the most important tip is uh, not to do it alone. I mean, the dynamics that happened around Greta Thunberg uh, over the last years, I think they are unique, and I don't think something like this will happen again, and it's great that it happened. Um, but I think Whenever you want to initiate something, try not to do it alone. Try to find allies, try to find people uh, who share the same opinions, who share the same uh, yeah, idea that there is a cause and it's to be followed. Um, because the more people you are, the more likely it gets that the voices will be heard. I mean, there's a lot of research on that. And um, yeah, I think getting, getting together, building, building strong communities or building strong groups, um, acting for a specific uh, specific goal, I think this is uh, the most important tip. And maybe the second, 
and it might also, also relate to uh, yeah your your study courses programs. Um, try to try to take uh, an interdisciplinary systemic lens. Um, we have still a very fragmented uh, science uh, in Germany and all around the world. We have psychologists, we have physicists, we have uh, no, no, physicists, uh, physics, anyway, uh, like very, very many different uh, disciplines. But we need to understand that many of these disciplines need to act together, interdisciplinary, because uh, the system curve does require input from, from every science uh, out there. And this yeah, this needs to be intertwined, and I really recommend that from the beginning of your study, you try to get into this perspective and think about how how can my discipline contribute to this overall uh, goal? How where where are the uh, where are the overlaps with potentially uh, with potential other um, yeah disciplines? Professor well, Beza, uh, I have to say thank you very much for giving us some advisors, giving us some background in the area how to change our behavior and uh, what to do in order to be kind of ambassador in their, their homeland, in order to find other people and encourage them to do something in this field. Thank you very much for contributing to this presentation. Okay, um, I'm looking at the, at, the, at the clock. Excuse me. Professor Jason, yes. Yeah, I just, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to say uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, yeah, to, to provide some, some aspects of our work. And uh, I find it absolutely important what you're doing there. And uh, kudos to all those people sitting there and uh, engaging in this topic. So, uh, well, thank you very much. And I'm sorry I have to leave because I have uh, my next um, appointment. Sorry. Okay. Uh, right. Have a good day. Bye bye. Take care. Okay. Professor Laser. <laughs>